All right, we're live. So welcome. If you're um, new here, my name is Monica of Millie and Monica, and I am and I'm a full-time clothing reseller on both Poshmark and eBay. So if you've been around here for a while, you know that I particularly love selling vintage clothing. And I usually um, are mixing vintage clothing in a lot of my thrift hauls that I share here on YouTube. So yeah, most of my content here on YouTube is related around Poshmark. And I have a lot of thrift hauls and Q and A's, what sold videos and that sort of thing. But I wanted to bring on my really great friend, Carrie Carnet Creative, who has an extensive background in vintage clothing in not only buying and selling it, but just all things vintage. So she's here with me today and we're gonna talk about what is vintage, how to identify it so that you're able to go about selling it online. Um, so I'm going to, in a moment, have her kind of introduce herself and talk a little bit about her background. So before we do all that, I want to make sure that if you haven't yet subscribed, that you go ahead and do so. Subscribe to my channel, but also open up a new tab. Go to Carrie's channel at Carnet Creative and subscribe to her because she is starting a new channel and she has so much amazing content to share. And I don't want you to miss any of it. So make sure you do that. And of course, hit that thumbs up because that really helps us out here on YouTube. All right, Carrie, I'll let you take it away. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. <laughs> As Monica said, my name is Carrie. I go by Carnet Creative on Instagram and then on all selling platforms, Poshmark, I sell on eBay, I sell on Etsy, I go as Carnet Vintage. I started collecting vintage before I was born. So I always, I said in my video, on my intro to my bio on my YouTube channel, um, my family started collecting vintage and antiques for me before I was even born. So I started in the trade. Um, everyone in my family loves something that's old and unique and I grew to love that as well. I started collecting when I was about six or seven, so as long as I could walk and talk and dress myself. Um, I started reselling when I was 11, so I started selling at yogurt sales and church rummage sales, and now I am a full-time reseller as of April. I sold at uh, vintage shops all over Philly and New York for the past four years, and then I managed an worked at a vintage boutique and showroom in my hometown through high school to um, a year after I left college. So I went to school for fashion design. I was there for about a year at Parsons in New York City and it wasn't the right fit for me. And I dive into that a little bit on my YouTube video as well. So just a little bit about me, but I am so excited to share with you guys. Um, if you don't have any experience with vintage, if you're hesitant to shop vintage, um, or if you are a seasoned collector and you wanna start selling, or if you have been selling for decades and are just here to share some information too. And I know we have the chat box open. We'd love to hear you introduce yourselves, where you sell, if you sell, where you want to sell, or a little bit about yourself. Awesome. All right, I love that. So personally, I just wanna share a little bit about my background with vintage because it is very different from Carrie's. Uh, and I don't think I've ever kind of explained to my followers like how I got started with vintage and like why I love it so much. And honestly, I've just always been fascinated by the past. I mean, it started with books and then it just kind of spiraled into clothing because we all love clothes here, I think. But when it really like something was spurred with me is I started going through all my grandma's photo books, like her old photo books. And she was so good about dating all the photos. Like she'd put the date below the photos and I would just study what they were wearing. So my grandparents had big families, like 12 kids, lots of girls. And I would study what all the girls were wearing in all these photos. And I mean, I would see it change from the you know 50s, 60s, 70s, into the 80s. And I was like, wow, this is just fascinating. So I was just always fascinated with that. And actually I, I give my grandma so much credit because not only I was inspired by her photo albums, but she was really into photography and like sewing and you know all of this stuff. So a lot of my creativeness comes from her and my mom. So not only was I studying their photo albums growing up, I was also like going through patterns and 
looking at the dates and really getting to see like, I don't know where, here we can kind of see them. These are all from the 70s and I have a lot of them. Most of them are actually from the 70s, but I have others somewhere around. But I would really study patterns and like what the styles were in those patterns. And I kind of taught myself, sorry, more so visually uh, about vintage clothing. And so that's kind of how my love of vintage began. And of course there's more to the story, but that's where a lot of my vintage knowledge kind of comes from. And it's a lot more amateur. <laughs> so I am so excited to ask you so many questions about how to identify vintage. But before I get to those questions, Carrie, can you help us just with the big question of what is vintage? Like what classifies a piece of clothing as vintage? Yeah, it's definitely a broad range. And I think it's hard, especially when a lot of things are vintage inspired or have vintage style. Um, and in Poshmark, anyone can select anything as vintage as the brand. But vintage is identified as something that dates to 20 years or older past the current uh, year that we're in. So because we're in 2020, anything from the 2000s is considered vintage and back. So generally the cutoff for antique, which is often interchanged with vintage, and sometimes it's hard to identify either, but anything that's antique is going to be a hundred years or older to the prior decade we're in. So 40s is technically vint uh, vintage right now and not antique, but it gets a little bit messy in between there. But generally that's the guideline of what the broad vintage community and the Webster dictionary defines vintage as. Perfect, thank you so much for kind of defining that for us. Okay, so next like let's dive into tips for actually identifying vintage. And you know, I talked a little bit about kind of creating my visual study guide and with that like, collecting vintage magazines from thrift stores. Um, you know, there's so much out there on YouTube, like we're on YouTube now. There's so many ways you can kind of get visual information, but when it comes to actually looking at the clothing pieces, uh, let's kind of get into specifics there. Like what are things we can look for on actual items? Yeah, yeah, I'll grab an example. Um, so here, we have a top and somebody might see this and be like, oh my God, that's so ugly. Or somebody be like, oh my God, my aunt has that same shirt. But what makes this different? This is a very classic equestrian motif. And this could be made in like, I think it was really common in the Etrusian era. Um, and that was something that was very adaptive, especially in Hermes uses this pattern a lot. But what makes this blouse vintage. Our first step is to see if the item has a label. So this label, you can get close to it, you can see that the fonts are different. So a lot of times um, on newer labels, you'll see that the font is consistent, but this one is different. It may, is made of a um, cotton label, which usually they're poly or made of recycled materials now and it does actually have a size tag which is pretty rare for the era and then it says Paris and made in France so first of all you're like oh that's expensive it's made in Paris but because of the different fonts and the label material you're able to automatically ring a bell this is vintage perfect and like if someone's not really familiar with vintage labels where is a good place for people to look Yes, our holy grail, there is not one person I've met in the vintage community, old or young, experienced or none, that has disregarded or not mentioned the Vintage Fashion Guild. It is an online forum of incredible historians, sellers, um, vintage connoisseurs, collectors, historians that archive everything from labels to fabric to notions to um, how to wear a hat, what hats they have in their archive, what hats they're selling. Um, and it really highlights everything that you would possibly need to know. And it's an incredibly valid resource for anything vintage. Yes, I definitely love that site and have definitely been looking up labels for a long time there. 
what if do you ever come across like a label that you just can't find on there what does that mean yeah a lot of times labels are there's multiple labels on a garment if it's a higher end piece so you'll have your main label here and sometimes the label will be and i think i have a dress that has a label um a lot of times they'll be in the inside of the hem on the lining so it'll be on the stitch line here or in this case the dress the label is in the bodice so a lot of times the main designer will be on the bodice it'll be in the hemline but on the top it will have like a department store label and the department store labels are generally hard to track down. Um, the Guild is probably the best place to find that, but there was so many department stores. It's basically like a chain of Target now. Um, so they're pretty hard to find. A lot of them went in and out of business and a lot of them were like the um, John Wanamaker in Philadelphia stood the test of time for decades, if not a hundred years. So generally the department store label would be on the top if the designer is listed below it, it will be attached, or it will be in the hemline, the um, bodice, or the top of the item. Awesome. Is there anything else with labels that we should know? Like, obviously, font is really important. You kind of touched on what the label is made out of. Uh, is there any other keys to the, the label itself? Um, it definitely can tell a lot about the item. It can tell about the condition. It can tell about like this one. This is a vintage dynasty label from the 1940s. You see that this has like a natural patina to it. It's weathered. It has some wear. Um, and it's all like woven in a lot of times screen printed labels or, um, Labels that have contrasting stitching that are black and white are more than often newer, where this one has like a soft gray. So that one's a good one to tell. Sometimes you'll have labels like this <laughs> that is shredded and you can't mm -hmm. tell what it is. Um, but this is also a great indicator. This is a cotton label. So you'll be able to tell that this is vintage. This is something that stands out as has been worn and loved and potentially is a couple decades old. My last example, this is an Indian dress from the 1970s. It just has a number on it. So <laughs> generally, unless it's a sample, these pieces that might have just like a simple number, sometimes it's just like a size on it. Like that one as well. This one's a pair of Asian brocade pants from the 40s. And this one just has a simple 14 for the size. There's no other markings on this. It was part of a set, but that's the only identifying factor on that. I love it. This is all great. I love that you have examples of so many things. Now here's the tricky question. What if an item you're pretty sure is vintage, but it has no tags, like nothing? Yeah. What do we do then? So we launched a full on <laughs> investigation. Um, so once we have no label, our best identifying factor is the silhouette. So a lot of times it is confusing and a lot of times by decade, the silhouette um, is adapted. So a lot of times 1940s and 1920s items are used in 1980s pieces. So the drop waist, the shoulder straps, the um, unique fit and flare waistline from the 1950s might be put in a modern dress. But once you kind of have a vintage silhouette down, another great way is the stitching. So you'll see in this pants that they are machine stitched, but they're actually pretty far apart. I'm like, I'll get a little closer. <laughs> Can you guys see? Um, but you see that the stitches are a little bit larger. This shows that it was a, a machine that was cranked by hand. Um, you'll also see that the edges aren't finished. So a serger did not exist in this time or it was not present, but this is an industry garment. So it wasn't made by a home. So a lot of times if it doesn't have a serge, it's, uh, it might be a homemade garment, but in this case it was not, it was a little too early for that. Another great telling sign, this one has no zipper on it. 
So closures are a huge, huge telling sign of the era of the garment. This one is just a simple celluloid button, which we'll come back to. And there are a few snaps. So in the 1940s, the middle zipper started coming about. So this is like very early 40s. So you'll see a metal zipper, first of all, is great for 1960s and older, which I'll have a 1960s shift dress here. So this one you'll see has a metal zipper, which I'm like getting close enough, and you'll see that the teeth, that's cool to the touch, there is no shiny plastic in sight, and it is a cotton um, sides on this one. So anything with a metal zipper, usually correlates from the 1940s to the 1960s. So that is definitely vintage, nailed down a little bit closer to what the decade would be for that. Um, I hope everyone is taking notes right now. Like I know like personally, I'm going to be replaying this back and like writing down all these tips and all these things because it's just so much great information. I feel like I'm on the home shopping channel, so. <laughs> This is like my ultimate dream. I wanted to work on QVC for the longest time, so. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, I'm gonna zoom this out. There we go. Perfect. Yes, I have a whole situation here. But, <laughs> so you have metal zippers. Um, this one is when the plastic zipper started coming about. This is a plastic zipper. I don't even know if this is really helping, but I'm gonna still you know try. What? It might be better to do this closer Sorry. one because we can um, see the details better. So you'll see that the, generally the zipper teeth are a little bit more translucent. It usually has a synthetic blend to the sides of the zipper. And you get this, I don't even know if my audio will catch it, like very distinct, like almost nails on a chalkboard sound. Mm -hmm. So these you will not feel like cool to the touch. This is obviously a plastic zipper. So this piece dates from the 1970s and newer so this dress is actually from my personal collection it's one of my favorites we'll just take a moment for this but wow it's gorgeous it is all 80s all day Whew. what i love about it is that it is so 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 40 still it has these beautiful um i don't even know what you would call this like ruching that mm -hmm. gathers the side it's very popular in uh Mr. Mugler's couture pieces, and then the capped, almost bat wing short sleeves that are super unique. And I have actually a true 40s novelty blouse here. And this wow. has very, like the exact same bodice. <sighs> That's gorgeous. That print, I mean, wow. Isn't that insane? I got this in Chicago and it's all silk. Oh, um, wow. And a lot of times the fiber is a huge telling sign as well. So more natural fibers, your wools, your cottons, your silks, they are an immediate alert that it is something that's vintage. Not always. There's always exceptions to the rule. So that's when you can do your metal zippers, your uh, snaps, and your buttons to see, and also your stitching patterns. So in here you'll see... A lot of times they're a little bit more tailored too. So you'll see these and these princess darts that are sewn in. Let me see the stitch line here. This is this is just the example that I needed and I didn't even know it. This has the um, pinking shears at the side. So this is what people did pre-serger and this helped keep the sides from fraying. So we didn't have sergers in the 40s. Um, and yeah, there's that one. Awesome. Okay, so you've touched on zippers, and we've talked about closures a little bit. You've mentioned buttons. Yes. I am so curious. So for those of you watching, Carrie and I are obviously friends. We chit chat often. We had a conversation last night about buttons, <laughs> and I was blown away because like I've known about zippers, like enclosures, and blah blah blah, but I didn't even like it. Didn't even dawn on me that you know around the 60s, plastic became really, really popular. Like it, plastic, it was around before the 60s, but it became more popular. And so it obviously makes sense that buttons weren't always plastic. So can you tell us a little bit about buttons and what to look out for with that? 
Yeah, so first of all, like we said, buttons are a huge alert that something could be vintage, but the material of the buttons is a huge telling time on the decade of the buttons as well. So what I was saying to Monica earlier was buttons, unlike I'll start with plastic is something that was a very early substance, but it wasn't used for mass production until war world two. And uh, so the war era in the forties was when um, plastic was a little bit more of a used material. Um, Bakelite is, if you guys don't know, it's a phenolic resin and that started being used in the early 1900s and it was also used as a huge novelty product in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. They realized that there is formaldehyde in this product and it was highly toxic to people that were making it, but everything from golf clubs to chess sets to buttons to crazy jewelry and it does fetch a pretty penny right now um, because it is so rare. But that is the earliest plastic that you will see. So in general, they came in a series of colors. It's called apple juice, which is like a slightly sheer um, off red orange color. It literally looks like apple juice and then um, a bright cherry red. And then it comes in a butterscotch. So it's a bright vibrant yellow and then there is a green there is occasionally black and occasionally white and then there is called end of day bicolate which has a swirl through it so basically whatever colors they had at the end of the day they swirl together and it creates a beautiful marble effect for those so if you see any of those colors um, and they're more intricately carved because that was common for that that would also ring your bell as a potential vintage and very rare garment. <laughs> Even if you if the dress is shattering and disintegrating, get those buttons and put them on eBay because somebody will go nuts for them. Um, and another popular material for buttons is celluloid. So celluloid is also a form of a plastic. You'll see them as very finely carved. Oh, should I should have grabbed mine plastic bangles they were also super popular then too they also as you can see in this button this gives a good representation of that and then i see michelle googling big light buttons and it's it's a rabbit hole for sure monica was down that um and then other than that your main button materials for um the 1940s and earlier would be metal they would be um, mother of pearl, shell, or abalone, and all of those will be cool to the touch. So those are a great uh, way, if you're not immediately recognizing these materials, that you'll be able to see. They'll have the mother of pearl, the celluloid, and abalone will have a little bit of a sheen to them. I have a pair of early 1900s. These are men's riding droppers, but my personal favorite linen pants. So I have an array of buttons on here. Oh, I think, okay, here, this one. This one has a sheen. As you see, it catches the light. This is a mother of pearl button. So this is very common on a garment. Now up here, this was a replacement button. This is very clearly plastic. It has the ridge on it, which mother of pearl buttons or abalone will not have that ridge because obviously the shell breaks in sheets and we have more plastic buttons. This one's a little bit of a unique one. This one has some, let's see if I can get it, ridges and details on that as well. So this one's a little bit of an earlier button. This one's 1950s. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that information. Now you've, you've also talked about hems a little bit. Uh, is there anything else we need to know about like the hems of, of items? Yeah, um, I mean, this one, like, this is the surging that I was talking about before, if you need, like, a visual. Um, generally, with vintage, a lot of them will have a, um, a blind hem. I almost lost it. And um, that's just to be super, super, you just, like, a pick stitch at the end. And that was very common because most pieces were tailored or custom made um, in those eras as well. I'm trying to think of what else I was... I think that was it for that yeah i think i have some pieces to share in a little bit yeah that um that i find with those types of hems like when i find those pieces a lot of times the hems are undone 
And it, I feel like they fall apart easily if they were sewn and then they need to be rehemmed, which is like my least favorite thing to do. And we were talking about this earlier, how those items end up just sitting for oh, yeah. so long. Oh my goodness. But that's a whole nother thing to talk about. So <laughs> uh, do you want to talk a little bit more about fabric? Because I know like in the 70s or 60s, 70s, we see a bit of change in what type of materials are being used. So how does that help us date items? Yes, um, so I had mentioned earlier, your um, natural fibers are a huge telling t sign. Um, but let me see, I have some like poly 70s. So elastin was popularly, popu I can't talk today. Um, so elastic was, invented in the 1820s, which was used for gloves and suspenders and all that fun stuff. But elastane was invented early 1930s and it became really popular in the, came very popular in underwear first, obviously. And then by the 60s, early 70s, it was made into a spandex or lycra. Um, and it gives this like bounce back effect to the fabric which was a game changer for people. These poly dresses are amazing. They're washer dryer friendly. They're, you can put steam on them, you can iron them. Um, they really have, you can stain treat them very easily. They have a lot of a great bounce back quality, but they're also obviously a synthetic fiber. So this usually comes in really bold prints like this butterfly or this one's a Vanity Fair robe and it was really great because they show color very very boldly and they stand the test of time very well um, but that's also a really good telling sign I know a lot of times um, like 70s pieces and 80s pieces will be easily confused for 1930s and 1940s these fabrics just simply did not exist in that era so that can be an easy easily checking off that that is not a possibility for those pieces. Um, and I think Foxborough, oh, Strap Foxborough, she had some good questions too we can revisit if you wanna jump back to those at some point. Well, and she mentioned too, I think this is important. Um, oftentimes buyers will wanna know the hem allowance, which is so true because maybe it's too short for someone and then they can lengthen it. Um, and that's that's always nice. And sometimes if someone's really petite, maybe they have, you know, taken that hem up quite a bit. Yeah, the hem allowance or seam allowance is uh, very good for most vintage sellers to mention in the description. In this dress, I'm like, I can't pull it. There we go. <laughs> there is about a 12 inch seam allowance here. It's pretty long. Wow. Um, and you'll see that the hem is very commonly just, like I said, the very light blind hem. You can't even see the stitch lines. Mm -hmm. But that was very common because a lot of these pieces were hand-me-downs. They lasted in families for generation, and they were constantly tailored to fit whatever person. But they also had the mentality and the intelligence to know that you might not be the last owner. So to keep that fabric intact and um, have that hem allowance is really wonderful to include in listings and can also help find a more broad buyer. Um, for that as well that might be a little bit taller than us petite girls <laughs> love that awesome all right so another thing i wanted to talk about was shoulder pads because i feel like shoulder pads can be a really great indicator of you know is this an 80s piece which i think is most commonly like i personally find i don't find much items that are older than 60s like i feel like it's harder it just gets harder because the items get older but also like I mostly find, you know, 80s, 90s items because, you know, they haven't been around as long. But shoulder pads, like a lot of items still have shoulder pads. Can you tell us a little bit more about them and how they kind of came about? Yes. Um, shoulder pads have very, very, very long history. So they actually started um, early in the Edwardian and Victorian era. I think they go back as far as early 1800s, but I have to double check. Um, but shoulder pads were at the height of their popularity in the 1940s. So again, on the um, 
I like I'm reading all your wonderful comments and I'm yeah, I know. <laughs> so they were really popular in the 1940s. A lot of times they were stuffed with leftover cotton or wool. So in uh, when you are looking at a piece and you might think it's 40s or 80s, the silhouettes are very similar. It will have the almost clumpy um, texture because obviously they bind together at a certain point. And I have, I have a couple good 80s. So there's some pretty extreme shoulder pads and they can get better or worse with age. This one is knitted. Um, usually 1940 shoulder pads are made of a muslin or cotton. Um, and this one is very even. It's very thick and you can feel the styrofoam in this. It's very squishy. Where this one, this is a beautiful dress from my friend Eileen that I'm not doing justice right now, but <laughs> This one, again, is lined in the original fabric and has a beautiful thin foam. Um, and you can feel this because you can feel the very porous material um, in that as well. But the 1980s, they don't change. They don't get all mushy. Um, and that's also a really great indicator of the era, but it can also be very confusing too. Thank you. I definitely, now that I think about it, have some that are more mushy and now I need to go back and look at those items and re-evaluate uh, some things, so. Yes, I saw that um, El Ducho Denali. This was my graduation party dress and it's a beautiful 1960s maxi, but it's a beautiful picnic print and then it's entirely sequined and then it has to open back. And oh my goodness, that's beautiful. incredible. Yeah, I felt like she doesn't have hanger appeal whatsoever. And when I saw her in the shop that I was working at, I put her on the mannequin and I was like, oh my God, this is so good. Like I should have this. So she's mine now. <laughs> that's awesome. I hope that's a piece that you'll keep for like a very long time. Yeah, I've had her for about, I guess, what, four years now, but she was actually in my attic. So I pulled her out just for the video. So she was packed away. That's awesome. You know, now that I think about it, I'm so sad that I didn't pull my first vintage find ever that I still own. I picked it up. I think I was this summer, um, fourth grade going into fifth at a garage sale. I still have it. And it's this gorgeous dress. And I'm bummed now that I didn't take it out of storage so we could actually identify it here on YouTube. Um, it's era anyways. But now I think we have some a little bit of fun. We're going to do unless there's you know something else, which I'm sure we'll talk about little things here and there. But we're going to get into kind of identifying some some pieces and see what we can get into here. Um, do you want me to start with a piece, or do you want to? I'm excited. Throw it at me. <laughs> okay, I just pulled a few, and these honestly are pieces that I've had hanging on my rack to list for so long, and most of them have a flaw of some sort, as most vintage items do, and I just haven't gotten around to fixing these flaws, and so they're they've been unlisted for a while. But so we're gonna kind of go, and you guys can you can guess in the comments like what era you think this is. So I know it's gonna be kind of hard to see. I'm gonna put this uh, in a different view here. Oh yeah. So it's polka dots. It's got some like little eyelet detail. This fun little collar, and it does tie. Have the tie at the waist, and I want you to see the skirt because this might help. So here's the skirt. It's more of a midi length. And then I want to show you the label and the zipper because, of course, based on what you all just learned, this might be important or should be important. So here is our label. I don't know if you can really see it, but no, but there's like no um, right. It, it's a junior five, and it's a poly rayon blend, and the zipper. So here's our zipper. It has, I don't think you can hear it. All plastic. <laughs> okay, all plastic. So what do we think this is? Like what era? I'll, I'll let you guys guess in the comments for a minute, but um, let's talk about the fabric. Is it, does it have a texture? Is it painted on? Is it like a PK? Or Ooh, that's a great question. You know, it appears to be painted. Okay. It kind of has a bit of a texture. Yeah. So I have some pieces over here. Actually, I'll switch it so we can talk about this if you guys want to guess still. Yeah, um, guess in the comments. 
is another piece from my personal collection. I'll pull her up here. But this is from the early 50s. And then you can see here that they have a lot of different colors, but um, they're all hand painted on this dress. So that's also a really great telling sign for vintage pieces that are also higher end too. So this one had at one point a really beautiful gold paint, which has since worn off. Um, but you can feel the raised texture and you can almost feel the, um, the fibers of the fabric picking through the paint. And then this one is also hand painted, I'm like playing musical chairs here. And I'll drag her up here. But this one has beading and this beading is um, plastic. So this one also has a like acid wash 80s feel. So this one is 80s, um, but it has the beautiful gold paint. And this one is listed in my Poshmark closet. Um, that is what that 1950s dress would have looked like a few decades ago. Fun. I know that some people were guessing. Yeah, so we had a few guesses here. So Carrie sang 70s. Uh, Fox, Fox, Shop Foxborough said 1970s. And we have another 70s. Yeah, That was my guess. Yep. Yeah, you guys are all spot on. It's definitely the fiber is very common for that era. It's very Laura Ashley, which was a little bit closer to 80s. Mm -hmm. But Jenny Sachs was a very, very popular dress style in that era. So you have the like prairie style, boho, Peter Pan collar with the cap sleeves. And yes, the empire waist as well as the long tiered skirt with eyelet trim. So all of those are mm -hmm. spot on for a 70s piece. Yeah. Um, we yeah. I have some very experienced people in here and I loved that you guys got it spot on. Perfect. So I'm gonna do another one from my pile. Uh, again, so there was a flaw with that one. There's a little stain on the white collar that I'm sure will come out. I just, that one's probably the easiest flaw that I could fix. Uh, this next one is a little bit more complicated, and actually there's something unique about the material that we can talk about too with this one. So this one I haven't really steamed yet, and it's very wrinkly. So we'll talk about what that might mean or tell us about this. Uh, there, I do have the, the studs or the rhinestones, but there's a few missing ones here that I need to replace, and I just haven't done. They, they were falling off. Now, I'm going to turn this around, I guess, so you can see a little bit more. It is long. Here's the the label. Uh, let's see if I can. I'm like, my eyes are so bad. Jackson Graves. Very Jackson nice. Jackson Graves. Uh, there is an address. There's no content, like material content. But look at, here's the zipper. So those labels were also very common for custom clothiers or tailors. So okay. sometimes if there's just an address, it's just simply the location or mm -hmm. it could be a pop-up boutique. So a little bit of research oh. things like that up as well. Perfect. Yeah. So it does have that metal zipper, the metal teeth here. And it is, this is a really gorgeous dress. It's one I'm of those, like, I just need to. 60s beauty. It need to fix it and like it's split in the front. Oh, Monica. Oh, no. This has been hanging for a year. Literally, like my clients go nuts over these. these Here's the hem. Here's what I want to show you. So this is coming undone. So this also needs to be fixed and I'm dreading it. Like I'm, I'm just, yeah. And it's kind of bunched up. So the hem tape will be, that's a pretty common condition for that. So if you want to zoom in and we can show everyone the um, hem tape on that is a rayon blend, so that's why it has that sheen. But generally, with the wash and wear, um, even the best dry cleaner, that will sometimes happen, okay. um, which usually affects the hem as well. But everyone's saying 60s. Yes, it is 1960s Jackie O style. Um, it looks very Princess Diana, though. Um, I feel gorgeous. like it's anything that's like a pale blue, I'm like Princess Diana, but obviously not on the right time period. The beautiful beaded collar, most of those look like they would be glass beads, which also add to the value. You can tell because they're much heavier as well, which is the same um, aspect for buttons. 
Um, and the usually in the back of those, they have a beautiful, like this one's a chiffon, has a beautiful cape in the back, which is oh, really yeah. cool that as well. You'll also see like a shawl collar in the back as well. And then it can also be brought to the front. And yes, it's a hostess dress. That's very yeah. nice. Yeah, it's gorgeous. I this I know this video is not doing this justice. I just really need. I know. I can't wait for you to model this. It's gorgeous and it's heavy, like you said. Like this collar. I mean, it's it's heavy. I mean, yeah. to wear it <laughs> would be heavy. <laughs> the material itself. Now, is there anything that we should know about like the? It, this is pretty wrinkled. Uh, is this common of the fabric? Yeah. So another great tech tip and like way to identify is the wrinkle technique which sounds kind of crazy but the silk chiffon and chiffon or even visco chiffon will wrinkle very differently so the silk chiffon has a very fine wrinkle pattern um, even if it's packed in a dust cover or a dust bag or a garment bag um, it will wrinkle in a very fine and it will wrinkle very, very easy. That's why it's not suggested for travel. That's why Hollywood stars rent uh, party buses instead of limos when they're going to the Golden Globes and Chiffon because they cannot sit down and it will show any crease. Oh, that's uh, cool. Yes, and that's why with the elastane and poly dresses, they were also super popular because they very, very rarely show wrinkles. They travel very well and you can steam and iron them very easily. Oh, fun. Okay, so I have one more, and this one's really been throwing me for a while. And I think I know, but I don't want to miss categorize it, I guess. Or uh, it is wool. It does have some flaws, which again. So here's the label. If you can kind of see it. Well, you're frozen for a second. Sorry. It, here's the label. If it's the label, I think it is. This is uh, very, it's R and K. I can't tell. It's still from a distance. Yep, it is. Yeah. Yep. I and love K. this label. So this was a really popular American brand. They also are very similar, similar to Kimberly Knits, um, if you guys know them too. They have a really beautiful tweeds, houndstooth, blue clays. Um, a lot of times they're very popular in the 1940s and 50s era. Um, but yeah, show off this beauty. I love this. Okay, so here's something that I don't know. The buttons, so there's buttons on the back. These feel like plastic to me mm -hmm. based on, you know, what we've chatted about. They definitely feel like plastic. Uh, it does have a snap here at the bust, but, and then there's a zipper. Okay, I'm gonna have to zoom this out so we can try to get a better look at it. I'll so, like switch this. You don't see my ugly steamer. Right. I'm trying. Like this is so hard. But here's this is what I love about this piece: is these little like this the waistline with the little pockets, uh, and then it, of course it's wool. Uh, let's see here. The hem is the hem is pretty good. Yeah, yeah. So wool dresses they hold up so well unless you have moss. If, if they're stored with cedar, um, they do really well. The only, so there is like some like kind of pilling on the armpits or somewhere in the armpits, which I do find often like the armpits and pieces will get really stained or kind of nasty. Uh, so that, you know, it's not terrible on this piece by any means. So that's the sleeve. But yeah, this is the piece that I'm kind of struggling with. Uh, based on our conversation, I, I still am unsure of this piece and how to date this one. Yeah. So. Foxborough, I love all your knowledge you're dropping here. Yes, R&K made dresses for a very long time. Um, but this dress, the, it actually buttons in the front. So this was really popular in the 1940s era. And this one has a middle zipper, right? So that's the thing. So I, I originally have always thought that this was a 40s piece, but I just am so uncertain that I, and I just don't have much, much experience. I think it is. If you look at this, yeah, I mean, it's. Yeah, I would date that one as a 1940s. I have a very similar um front on this one so this one has um plastic buttons as well and then they button down and then i must have been thinking oh wait yes so it actually has buttons all the way down there's no zipper on this one so it might be a little bit earlier but then you have your snap um 
And the covered snaps were very, um, that is if the labels cut out, covered snaps are generally a boutique or department store designer brand um, or house. Um, so that's also a great telling time of luxury as well. But yes, it's very confusing, especially when I had clients trying on the dresses, they very commonly would put the buttons in the back. Um, but a good telling sign is where the darts are sewn. And sometimes they're sewn so impeccably on the front and the back. But generally in the back, you'll have two that go straight down. And those are called your princess darts. I don't know if that one has it. Like here. Does mine? Mine has like, they're like panels almost. Yeah. Yes. So you'll see that towards the waistline, there's a straight line. So that's going to be your princess darts. Those were really common in tailoring in the 1940s and 50s. Okay. Um, and since it has a, a, a closer to, it's not like it's at your natural waist, not your like um, exaggerated waist, which would be closer to the 1950s. And then your front, you would have your bust darts. So those are going to be set higher up and they're going to have a curve, obviously, to accentuate your bust. Um, so that's also a good way if you're in a vintage shop and don't want to ask anyone. That's also a great way to tell if it's front or back. But so yeah, the waistline's a little like yeah, that gathered there. So you'll see that there's room for the bust. Interesting. So are you you're thinking 40s for this piece? Yeah, I would okay. say 40s for that one. That's what I was originally thinking, but I was just so nervous. Like, I didn't want to misclassify it or guess mislabel it. It's the biggest takeaway. You know, at the end of the day, I am not as much as I would love to be a certified fashion historian. Um, and this is what I live and breathe doing. But I also am very immune to making mistakes. There is always an exception to the rule. And there's always something to learn. So I think that's the most important thing. Like, you have a huge community either on the Guild on wiki or on the Poshmark community and i know that monica and i can both say if you ever have any questions we can always do like a q a video and have you send in pieces or dm us um and we'll do what we can to help answer your questions too but i think that's just like a good overarching thing to touch on you know i'm like yeah I am a human and I yeah. want to know all the answers, but at the end of the day, we're all learning. And I think that's really important too. Yeah, definitely. Because there's always going to be that exception that will like throw you off based on what you know and make you like second guess yourself or, you know, so many of those pieces, like we've already touched about touched on, you know, we're inspired by other eras and so it can get confusing. So yeah. Uh, is there, any like burning questions like from anyone in the comments uh is there anything that you want us to talk about touch on because we're probably going to wrap this up pretty soon i know something that i do want to ask carrie though before we kind of wrap this up is you know we've talked about the vintage fashion guild as a resource is there any other resources you would recommend for people who are looking to learn more like what would you recommend yes so Obviously, when you go to a thrift store, or sometimes um, even vintage stores, there might be a lot of modern pieces mixed in. But generally, your local vintage store, if you don't have a local vintage store, flea markets are a great place. Um, and then there's also some major vintage expos on the east and west coast that are included. Current Affair does one in Brooklyn and L.A., um, the Manhattan Vintage Show or the Vintage Show does one in um, East Village, Manhattan. And then um, there is um, Brooklyn Flea. And then I, what was the other one? Artisan Fleas and uh, Premier Vision, which is focused as a print show. So a lot of times it's a very discounted mm -hmm. ticket if you sign up online. Mm -hmm. And that way you can... Um, go and a lot of the times the dealers have the card on the piece that dates to the 50s a lot of them separate them based on their decades um so that way you can kind of quiz yourself and see like okay what am i noticing here oh this is a fit and flare hemline has a surge and their plastic buttons this one's probably in the 1950s 60s era and you flip the card 
you probably have your answer. And that's a great way to open dialogue with the dealers if they're willing to chat, if you're willing to have any questions. Sometimes they are, if they're not busy, they're happy to talk about it. They're obviously very interested in it. That is a great way. Um, and Instagram accounts, there's some really, really amazing Instagram accounts in the uh, community. Um, some of my favorites are History a la Mode, AMT Vintage, which is located in New Jersey, um, Butch Wax Vintage, which I know she has a cult following. Another great one is Fox Historic Costume. Any um, costume or um, historical restoration accounts are really really, really, like, I can't stress it enough, have so much knowledge and constantly each post dump uh, something new and something incredible to learn. Iris Apfel is one of my favorite vintage collectors. She is incredibly, so, so cute. I love her so much. And she has an incredible collection. And the last one is Timothy Long Fashion Curator. And he's on Instagram and he has a pretty incredible collection. I forget who he curates for, but there is so much knowledge. Oh, and the Vintage Voyager, and they are on Amazon Prime, and she goes to vintage stores all over the United States and does exposés and autobiographies and biographies on all these wonderful vintage sellers and their collection and if they have a storefront. Okay, so I think it's Andra in the in the comments. You have a lot of questions. Thank you so much for joining us. This broadcast, once we end it, will post to my channel. So you'll be able to re-watch it from the beginning. And we do actually answer like how old something needs to be to be vintage and all of that. So you'll you might want to go back and re-watch this because we dropped so much knowledge. And I hope that many of you, if you came in late or you know, once we started, that you'll go back and watch from the beginning because there's so much information that Carrie just dropped and it's been amazing. I have learned so much personally and I'm I'm so excited that I was able to have you on here and share this information with us. So I don't know if there's any other questions I'm gonna try to see here. Yeah, like Poshmark Closet is Carnet Vintage for Amber Resells that's asking. I know Monica will link that in the video mm -hmm. below. Um, Michelle, I am working on a series for identification tips on each decade. So come and subscribe. Go subscribe. <laughs> Go subscribe. Um, if you, you want to see, um, if you want to drop a DM on anything that you think that we didn't cover on this video, there might be a part two. Um, and I know that this is something that maybe not many people have experience with, or if they have experience with, know that every story is different. Every piece is bit different. And I know that um, Liz was saying that a lot of pieces are interchangeable with their decades. And it's true. It's it's hard work, you know. Um, I didn't just be able to look at a piece and tell the decade or tell the designer or recognize the print um, on a whim. I live and breathe doing this. This is what I do in my free time, in my spare time, and it's what I did for my occupation. Um, I started reading Vogue when I was seven years old, so I was constantly immersed in this, and it just comes from experience, but it's also a lot of work, but it also makes me so happy, and I love to share with other people because this information is for everyone, and we can all learn, and I can learn, especially from sharing that as well. Awesome. All right, so I think we're going to wrap it up there, and again, if you didn't watch from the beginning, go back and rewatch. There's so much info here. And if you haven't yet subscribed to Carrie's channel, what are you doing? So <laughs> you just crazy, so there's not much on there, but um, Monica has been an incredible influence and motivator and she has some really wonderful videos too. So make sure you subscribe to her as well. All right, friends. Well, thank you so much for being here as always. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks, guys.